So my name is uh, Dr. Ahmed, and um, I am the professor and the advisor for the injury management program at uh, Eastern. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know what uh, where Eastern Michigan University is. So let me give you a brief about where we are. <laughs> One of the things that we, people keep asking that, you know, we, we don't even know where uh, Eastern is. So for those who don't know where Eastern is, Eastern is uh, basically a small, uh, not a small country, it's one of the 14 university in the state of Michigan. Um, the state of Michigan is the seventh largest state. Uh, the thing that is common over here and that we are all proud of is the fact that it has a very diverse community. So if you look at this on the screen, you will going to see that we have, uh, our state is divided into two halves. The lower half is over here and the upper half is on this side. So the we have what we call it upper peninsula and lower peninsula. So we have two and they are basically connected right over here with a bridge. So there are two big uh, lakes. Uh, on the right side, we have Lake Huron. And on the left side, we have Lake Michigan. And in between, we the only way to cross this is this bridge, which is one of the biggest bridge, uh, hanging bridge in, in Michigan. Uh, the other important aspect of uh, this place is that we are very close to what we call as the city of Detroit. So this is where the city of Detroit is. And again, you can see that there is a river between and on the right side, we have Canada. So this is the Canada portion where we see the biggest city over there is Windsor. And from Detroit, to the next big city in Mich in Canada, which is Toronto, is around four my uh, four four hours drive. Okay. Can you keep um, uh, Unes? Can you get uh, the the participants uh, coming in, please? Get them admitted, please. All right. So, Detroit is famous for two things. Uh, number one is that it is called as the home of the automobile industry. And um, Henry Ford, uh, uh, who is the founder of the Ford Motor Company, used to live in the city of Dearborn, which is over here. So that's Detroit. And uh, somewhere around 15 miles away is Dearborn. The other aspect of Detroit is that apart from having three major um, automobile industry uh, companies, General Motors, Chrysler, and uh, Ford. We also are proud to be a part of a very diverse uh, uh, community of musicians. Michael Jackson was from, uh, uh, made most of his records over here in, in Detroit. So sometime Detroit is also called uh, uh, motor city, sometimes it is called as Mo City, or sometimes it is called as the music city of the world. Now, the closest you will going to see is Dearborn, and Eastern Michigan University is over here in the city of Ypsilanti. And uh, our university is right next to the one of the biggest university in the world, which is University of Michigan Ann Arbor, which is in the uh, Ann Arbor is a small city over here, but uh, it has one of the biggest university and uh, one of the top universities of the world. Uh, university of Michigan Ann Arbor is over here. So we are in Detroit. We have another big university, which is called Wayne State University. 
And in Ann Arbor, we have another big university, which is called University of Michigan. And Eastern is right in over here at in, in Ypsilanti. So it's very much close to it's 10 minutes drive from Ann Arbor and 40 minutes drive from Wayne State or Detroit. The other thing about this, that we have a very good uh, social and cultural aspect over here in, uh, in Ypsilanti. We have a very diverse community. We have people from all around the world. Dearborn is being the uh, big, biggest city uh, where we, ha uh, we have the most populated number of uh, Middle Eastern people uh, living in this place up outside Middle East. So the number of people, uh, uh, Middle Eastern people living outside the Middle East is in Mich Dearborn. And Dearborn is again, is very much famous for its uh, Mediterranean food, Mediterranean culture, a lot of Muslims over there. Uh, the other big city, which is not very uh, clear over here is called Canton. Uh, Canton is again, a, 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 now it is a growing community. Majority of the companies, um, uh, uh, sorry, employees or engineers from Ford Motor work over here. Ford Motors company's headquarters are in Dearborn. General Motors headquarters is in Detroit. Okay, so the accessibility to automotive com companies are very close. So <laughs> Canton Township, is the place where a lot of uh, engineers live. Um, we, this is also a very uh, fast growing, uh, uh, I will say very, very fast growing community. In the past 10 years, it has basically doubled its population. Then we have another small city within the city of Detroit, it's called Hamtramck. It's over here, if you can see my cursor. And the, it is one of the biggest community of Bangladeshi people. So people from Bangladesh, majority of them migrated in Hamtramck. Uh, it is also known as Bangla town. Um, and uh, again, uh, this is a very small city of, I would say, uh, total three by three miles radius. Uh, uh, a, 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 a section of uh, three by three uh, miles and it is a very small city inside Detroit um, and again it is uh, it has a lot of uh, Indians but majority of them are uh, Bangladeshis as well as Yamanis are here in this city. Detro uh, Dearborn is filled with uh, Iraqis, uh, uh, Yamanis, uh, Lebanese, uh, Jordanians all are here in De Dearborn. Then in the Canton area, we have a very huge population of uh, Indians, Pakistanis. Um, Ann Arbor is another place where there are a lot of Indians. We have two major uh, uh, temples in Ann Arbor and in Canton. A lot of mosques uh, for Muslims, a lot of mosques in the whole area. So uh, with respect to your social activities and social networks, uh, we are very finely located in a place where you can reach your own type of, uh, uh, your your own community. Uh, one of the thing which we would like to introduce to you is uh, what is Master of Engineering Management? It's called, usually called MEM. Um, and most of the time we, com we compare it with the MBAs, all right? One of the thing which which is where we are different from the MBA is the fact that majority of our students are have a degree in engineering or technology. So they are hardcore engineers. One of the basic uh, thing that is taught in engineering is what we call as physics. In physics, we learn a lot of rules but there are also laws. And one of the things which as an engineer, we are very proud of is that we follow laws, 
all right? And the laws that we have in physics, we understand that they cannot be violated. Nobody can violate that. Nobody can say that it is not true. For every action, there is a reaction. Nobody can say, no, it's not true. This is wrong. Nobody say that. There is no perception. So as an engineer, we always think to, in, in two ways. Either thing is right or thing is wrong. Whether it is zero or one. So we always have a black and white aspect because that's how our training is. We will say that if something is following the law or something is not following the law. So we are not talking about perceptions. We are not talking about opinions. All right. We have facts and laws behind us when we talk about it. So when we teach management in, in, in MEM programs, then in the MEM programs, the management is more about the system engineering concept. It is how, as an engineer, we will learn how to manage. The word management has this ability where you can manage a person or you can manage some other resources that you have. It can be money, it can be material, and so on and so forth. Sometimes you will going to have perceptions about people. Okay, there is you you hire somebody. All right, when you hire somebody, you are making a decision. Now there is no hard rule whether the person will be capable of doing the work that you are that they have been hired for. So there is a perception involved. There is an art involved in the selection process. So in some cases of management, majority of the time, we don't have the capability. B means the engineers do not have this capability of understanding the perceptions and utilizing the perception to make decisions. We are very hardcore. So we know that one plus one will be equal to two. There's no other way. The MBA degree is a little bit different it leans more towards the business skills of an enterprise. It basically is there to manage the whole business system, all right? So it is not targeted towards the engineer who is technically very creative. They are there to promote the business bottom line. That's the biggest thing. So now for us, the most important thing is creating product which are safe. All right. So there is a difference between creating a part which is safe and creating a business where the ultimate goal is the bottom line to have the max to maximize the profit. So when we as an engineer look at the to look at things, we thought we think that the engineering management degree is lined more towards the technical knowledge, how a system engineering concept is applied on the business, which is basically run by engineers, right? While the MBA degree is more targeted towards the business skill set. I hope it can differentiate, you can also differentiate between the two and why one is diff why one can be better for you and one other cannot be better for you. So you have to decide on, on this thing. I can make the decision for you. So the technical management, the financial management, the engineering project management, the technical skill leadership, the entrepreneurship, all these are the things that we study in the engineering management program. So you will learn this thing, but based on the concept that you are an engineer, you will be, uh, at the end of the day, you will be managing engineers. You will be managing projects which are very much in line with the engineering and technology. Any questions up to now? Okay. All right, let's move on then. Um, the EM, MEM program at East Eastern started back in 2000 uh, and our goal is to is is 
is to entertain a very simple principle. And the principle is we practice what we preach. And one of the things that we are very proud of is that our training that we call is as a training, our training in the MBA in the MM program is directly affecting your bottom line of your business. Majority of our students are full-time employed. Okay. 90% of our, our students who come to us are fully employed. So they already have a job and they are moving the ladder, moving up into the ladder and they are trying to come up with a way to go and do an executive management position. In that type of scenario, what we teach today in a classroom environment, you can apply tomorrow at your workplace. That's how much practical our uh, degree is. We, we try to give you tools. We teach you tools that are so effective that you can apply those concepts readily in your work environment. And we have tons of case studies where our students have created processes and created tools that have saved the company millions of dollars. The other thing which we, we, we our, our program, uh, because majority of our uh, students are, uh, are professional, that it lined up very well with, the, with, with their professional life. So we try to balance out uh, the professional life and their social life, uh, the personal life that is, and then we bring in the academics into it. So for those professionals, we offer them degree that can be fully online. And then for those who are trying to take the degree as a, uh, as a way to introduce new, tech, uh, new concepts to their already existing knowledge, for those we have traditional classrooms as well as the hybrid setting also. In a glance, the MEN program is, has, is required to have 12 courses. Out of these 12 courses, six are core courses. That is, you have to take those six courses and then the rest of the six are elective. The program is, as again, as I said earlier, the program is offered online. It can be, or uh, you can take the class totally online. You don't have to come to the campus. If you want to come to the campus, then you can have, a, you will be sitting in a traditional classroom environment. All the international students take, have to take traditional classes. So usually uh, we, our uh, international students are required to take three courses per semester. Okay, three courses per semester. Out of these three courses, uh, they can take all the three courses in the tra traditional classroom environment, or at minimum, they have to take two courses every semester in the traditional classroom environment. The third class can be fully online, can be hybrid, you, and if you want, you can take it, the third class also as a traditional. So out of every semester, the minimum course that an international student have to take is three. Non, uh, the uh, sorry, uh, is, there is another one. We have in-state and out-of-state. So in-state students, again, have the opportunity to come to the campus if they want to but they can also take the courses fully online. But these are only for those who have US citizenship. If you have, if you are outside Michigan, living in some other state, California, Ohio, or other places, then you are, again, you have an option. You can be living in the Ypsilanti and taking traditional classes, or you can take completely online. But all the international students have to be on campus, taking traditional classes, a minimum of two traditional classes per semester. Our degree does not have any master's thesis. Uh, you can take the whole degree uh, using courses and complete it. 
using the uh, 12 courses. Uh, we give a global perspective and uh, uh, an exposure in our uh, teaching. All our applications, uh, 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 application that we teach are, are tools that are very practical. We have a very interactive learning environment, either in the classroom, which is a traditional one, or online also. In both cases, the environment is very, very interactive. It is not that you usually see in other uh, online courses. Our online courses are also very tough to, to complete. It has the same rigor as a traditional classroom setting. You will be interacting with several of your classmates. There will be several uh, projects that will be done in teams. So it is not something that you can just do it on your own. You have to work with others also. This is one of the key things that we teach, how to work with others, how to create teams, how to ensure that the team can produce something at the end of the day. So for us, interactive learning environment is very, very important. Finally, as I said, because we have the three different mode of, uh, of teaching, hybrid, online, and traditional, our classroom environment is very, very flexible and you can schedule it in any way you want. Now, when we say schedule is flexible, we mean that for those who are US citizen, for them, it is very, very flexible. They can take, it just take only one class for one course per semester, that's fine. But all the international students have to take a minimum of three courses. That's by law. You have to take that much amount of courses. So that that's a, a very simple way of giving an, you an exposure about our program. Uh, what do you will going to learn in our courses? Uh, one of the things that we are very proud of is that at the end of the day, uh, once you have our degree, you will going to have a great leadership qualities. You will be excellent in managing project. You can advance your manufacturing and design skill if you intend to do it. We do make sure that you uh, that you are comfortable in understanding and applying lean concept as well as Six Sigma concepts. We have been introducing uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, decision support systems, both in manufacturing and in other areas of management like human resource, like uh, data analytics. So we do give you a very broad as well as in-depth knowledge in some cases about project management, process management, how do you design a process, how do you simulate a process, how do you make sure that the process can be continuously improved upon. So these are the skills that we teach you. We do want you to get certification because third party certifications are very, very important. So our courses prepare you for several professional certifications. Uh, from the Project Management Institute, you will be able to complete after taking our project management courses, you should be able to pass the PMP exam or the CAPM exam, Certified Associate Project Management or Professional uh, uh, pro Project Management. The SAE, Society of Manufacturing Engineers, have several certifications that our students have, uh, have been come clearing in their first attempt. Uh, they are Certified Manufacturing Technician, Certified Manufacturing a Manager, Lean and Brown certifications, uh, Six Sigma certifications. So you you have the capability to do it. We don't force anybody to, to do the certification. It's up to the individual whether they want to do it or not. Let's say you are in a class of project management and you said that uh, you will be able to pass the course. Uh, let's say you said I will, I'm going to complete the course of uh, certified and get the uh, certification in uh, uh, in associate project management. 
if you achieve that between in between the class session that is in the whole semester you have the time to basically apply uh, complete and pass the exam if you pass the exam you don't have to do our assignments our exams you can just get an a right away because you already have qualified to be a great project managers by a, 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 a obtaining this certificate so we do these type of scenarios to ensure that the students have the courage to take these exam and using the word courage in a very in, in a very very uh, uh difficult way because some of the time we use courage in 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 a, a non-positive way uh, so i'm talking about saying that you know you you have to rely on your guts and then go ahead and pass the exams right now we have three faculty members uh, dr booker uh, have just retired However, he is still being a part of our part-time faculty. Dr. Ahmad is uh, been working both in our program as well as in mechanical engineering program, undergrad program. He is one of the uh, guru in the area of virtual reality. Okay, um, I have been in this uh, in this area uh, for more than I don't know how many years, but. Since 1989, I've been teaching. So you can you can make do the math from there. The idea behind all this is that that we have a very good advisory board, and majority of our advisory board members uh, are directly coming here as a part of our program or not. These people mark. Sorry, Mike Matthews, Matt Weber, and Neil Endel are our graduates. And in this one, Mike is one of those uh, person who is managing more than 300 engineers at a time. And these are the people who basically advise us what is coming, what changes have to be made. Uh, we have a very good uh, uh, relationship with the uh, Army and Navy, uh, a lot of uh, Air Force uh, en uh, engineers basically take our programs and pass it out. Uh, they are required to, in order for them to move the uh, the ladder, they have they are required to get a master's degree. And one of the things that we have found is that uh, these engineers who have been working with the D Department of Defense. Uh, has a very good understanding of being a part of a team, but uh, uh, managing the team and creating yourself and, and make, making yourself as a leader is something that our uh, courses have been teaching to these guys. Uh, we have got several awards in the past few years. Uh, we, we we basically look at, at them as a sign of saying that, you know, this is one way of us uh, to uh, tap our back, but also this is one way of saying that we need to improve. Uh, if you are an international student, okay, for all the international students, you need to make sure that you have evaluate got your evaluation on your degree so we need a minimum of 2.7 gpa in your undergrad program 2.7 but we don't accept directly the grades or the gpa or the cgpa from your university we have your that degree or transcript have to be evaluated by a third party I can provide you, uh, uh, UNES can provide you right now the link from where you can find the names of those people. Okay, I can also show it to you. Then the second thing you have to do is to make sure that you have clear the uh, English as a second language test. And we have several types of form TOEFL to IELTS that you can take. And we have a minimum requirement for each one of them. Okay. 
So these are the two major things you have to do. The third thing you have to do to apply is to write an essay about why do you want to join the program? What is your reasons behind it? Now, we, we use this for two purposes. Number one, we want to see your intention that after you graduate from our program, what your plans are. We want to see the direction you want to take in your life based on the fact that you have certain type of undergrad degree. Then we want to see how your MEM degree from us will facilitate for you to reach to your destination where you want to see yourself in the next five years time frame. The these are the three major requirements that we have. Number one, again, your GPA has to be 2.7. Number two, you have an, let's say you are doing an, a, a test, IELTS test, so it should be 6.5. And then the third one is that you need to show us a, a small essay, you should need to write us an essay about saying that why, do you are, why are you interested in our program? So these are the three basic requirements. So what will happen if you uh, want to uh, see that you can, um, uh, you want to be a part of our program, for example. So one of the things that uh, we are trying to do, and I'll show it to you in a minute. Let me share this the screen with you. So, Our website is emish.edu backslash em. Okay. Once you are here in this, there is a program eligibility. You can click over here. And this is a form which tells you each and everything about our program. You write your name, you give us your scores of uh, English as a second language. So let's say you are doing TOEFL, we are required it to be 75 on IBT. Uh, TOEFL is essential. If you are doing that, we need nine score. I'll test, we need 6.5. Uh, Pearson, we need 70. Michigan English test, we need 57. Dong uh, Dolingo, we need 105. So these are the various ones that you can take. If you fill up this form, all right, we will be getting, we can get back with you and let you know whether you have a chance. Again, I'm using the word chance, whether you have a chance of getting accepted in the program. Why I'm saying that? It gives you an understanding that, you know, uh, I have the credential to get accepted. Once you once once you have that understanding, then and then you can go. We can ask you to go and apply for the program. And when I say apply for the program, there is on our website there is a link to apply. So you can go there and apply. Now. Application fees is around $45, okay? So just make sure that unless you are sure that you can get in, I will not recommend you to spend $45. So let me be very honest. I understand that $45 is a big amount. So unless you are sure, or somebody give you a probability of acceptance to be 80%, 90%, then you can apply. Otherwise, you, you, you need to think about whether you have uh, because you don't want to uh, get your forty-five dollars wasted, so this is this is some an on, on, on honest thing coming out from me, and I don't want you guys to think that we are here to grab your money. We we are not. So that's why we have this eligibility form that they don't require you to do anything except fill up this form, submit whatever we are asking, and we'll let you know whether you can get in or not, okay? So this is a shortcut that we have been using. The, yes, uh, Fussy, you have a question, go ahead. Um, 
first of yeah, all, I'm thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Ahmed, for this uh, amazing uh, presentation that you have given and uh, told us about the program. Um, and I especially appreciate for this form, this eligibility uh, checking form. This is a very unique thing that uh, I think we desperately needed. Uh, so thanks for that. I'll definitely fill it and uh, check my eligibility. Uh, but uh, I just have two questions. So the first question is, uh, like, what is the general acceptance ratio in the department? So that is the first question. Like if I or anyone applies, oh, how much chances do they have of acceptance? So, and the second question is about graduate assistantships. So uh, for instance, once uh, one person gets admitted, so is there any possibility they can get graduate assistantships? And I, I think you've got it. So thank you. Uh, these are the two questions. Okay. Uh, these are very uh, good and genuine questions. Uh, let's start with the first one. What is the uh, acceptance rate? I can tell you one thing. If you qualify for 2.7 and let's say you uh, you have a, uh, a score of uh, 6.5 in ILS, the chances of you go get, to get admission is 100%. Okay. Uh, we do, as I said, uh, take uh, read through your uh, essay, but your essay is mostly used for us to judge whether you have the capability of the or have the writing skills that we require uh, for our program. Uh, we have not rejected anybody based on that particular third aspect. So your your your. Decli uh, decline, um, if we decline you, then the majority of the cases will be that you either have a less GPA or you don't have the English. However, if you have less number, let's say you have 2.6, okay, and your ILS is 6.5, fine. So you, you have a less uh, GPA and you have written a very convincing letter or essay. Now the essay will come a lot because now you are short of 0.1 GPA to qualify to our program. There will be a good chance that you can get a conditional admission. In the conditional admission, we will require you to do, if you have a GPA less than 2.7, in most cases, you will be required to take one extra course. So instead of taking 12 courses, you will be required to take 13 courses to graduate. And we will require you that in the first semester, you should have a GPA of three and up. That is, you should have minimum score in all the three courses that you will take in your first semester, your GPA should be three. This means that all the three courses, you should have a minimum of a B in all of them. That will ensure that you will not going to go, uh, have a GPA of less than three. So there is something called conditional admission. So you can get a conditional admission if you have a GPA a little bit less than 2.7, don't go up to 2.5. I'm talking about 2.6, 2.65. In that range, you can, you can, you, there is a possibility, good possibility rather, say it like this. You have a very, very good possibility that you can still get in with on a conditional. But trust me, if you cannot complete the three courses with a GPA of three, uh, you will be on probation. And uh, after the first probation, you, if you don't get the, the your GPA up again in the second semester, you can be disqualified or you can be removed from the program. So that that is always there. If let's say you have a right GPA of two point seven and up, but you have a, instead of six point five, you have six in your English test, or a little bit less in any test that you have given. 
again there is a possibility that you can get in a conditional admission and that conditional admission will require you to do two things either you will they will require you to go come here and redo the test and score better or we will require you to take at least two courses of english with us and if you get b plus or b or more than b in those two courses you will be from conditional will be removed and you will be fully admitted in the program so that is the scenario whether you can get in 100 percent if you have the first two things done that is score of uh, uh, 2.7 gpa and a score of uh, uh, ILS score of uh, uh, 6.5 or the other ones that we are given then there is a hundred percent guarantee that you will be getting the admission okay any 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 question on this thing before i move to the G, G, uh, uh, ga positions or uh, scholarship posi uh, things no thank you uh i have also shared my cv so you can uh answer the second question better so that the second like point that. that you have raised is the gp uh, is a graduate assistant positions all right now we do have graduate assistant position uh, which uh, not only that it is there in our school but it is also there in other colleges and schools on the campus Right. So it's not necessary that you get a, a GA position from us. You can get it from any other department also. So that's one thing. The other thing that you have to uh, remember about this is, is, is the fact that uh, GA positions are given to very unique people. Not only that you have a GPA of 2.7 and a good proficiency in English, that's not the basic thing. You need to have X amount of a skill set that you are bringing in onto the, the table. For example, uh, let's say you have uh, a very good uh, teaching experience at uh, university level, or you know how to conduct experiments in the area of uh, your studies. For example, you are a mechanic, uh, electrical engineer or mechanical engineer, you must be doing uh, those uh, lab work in your university. Do you know how to conduct those labs? Do you know how to uh, work with the students and teach them those type of scenarios? The other skills that we usually look for is what type of software skills you know, what type of uh, application you can run so those are the things that separate you out from others. So we get hundreds of applications, for example. Then our deciding factor will be the, if the first, in the first round, our deciding factor is what type of skill set they have. Because all of them have a GPA of to, to some uh, to greater than 2.7, and some of them will going to have a GPA of 3.8 and 3.9. But again, if they are looking for, if they think that the GPA of 3.8 will get, they get them a GA position, not necessary. It is the skills that they bring to the table. Because if you want a GA, which is a graduate assistant, then there are two types of graduate assistant. One is called graduate teaching assistant, and the other is called graduate research assistant. Those are two different things. In the uh, former one, you have to go into a class and teach there, undergrad student, to teach undergrad student. That can be a lab where you are going and teaching them uh, how to perform experiments. Or that can be a class that you have to go and teach. Or that can be helping out a professor in grading and, uh, and monitoring the class. So that's a teaching assistant. Again, in order to, for you to qualify for teaching assist, assistant, you have to have that credential with you up front that you have taught somewhere. You have a, a, a scenario where you can show that how good your teaching skills are. You have to 
tell us what skill set you have in order for you to teach that thing. So if you are saying that I can perform, if you are a mechanical engineer and you are saying I can perform uh, gas dynamics of experiments, then we will, uh, we would, you should write what type of experiment can you conduct? Can you help a student to learn? If you are saying that you have worked on the wind tunnel, then which type of wind tunnel you have worked with? How that will, uh, and, and how that experience can help the university or the professor that you are applying for to get you as GA position. The other GA position is called the research one. Now, research is totally different. Here, you have to line up your experience with the professor's research area. And that's where you have to look into what are the research area they are working in and how my skill set can facilitate that, can help that. Remember, this is all about you convincing somebody that you are needed. You have a need for them. You tell us how can we uh, help you. I'm not going to say that, oh, I need you. You have to tell me that I have the skill and you need that skill and I can help you, Dr. Ahmed. That's what I'm looking for. But that's what any professor is looking for. The chances of getting a GA position in the first year is very low. Okay. Let's say you apply, you got admission, and you think you will get the GA position. That chance is low, very low. Only few of very elite people get that opportunity. However, once you are here and you showcase your skill in a classroom environment, okay, you will be, you will be in a class, you, you have the ability to impress your professor. That is one way of getting a GA position in the next semester. That is a one way of getting a student assistantship next semester. So even if we have people who got the student assistantship right when they arrive over here. So they come here, they talk to the professor, they show their uh, transcripts to them, uh, to, to show their resumes to them, they start talking to them, try to explain them what they are capable of doing, and the student teacher can hire them on certain student assistant jobs. These are academic jobs. Then there are non-academic jobs which are available in the on the campus. And these are very good paying jobs. These are nothing, nothing is paid less than $12 an hour. Right? And you are able to work 20 hours on campus. You are eligible to work 20 hours on, on campus per week. Right? So that's a enough, good enough time to earn enough money to pay your rent, number one, and pay your um, uh, uh, food expenses. Two things are taken care of by, the, by you working over here on campus. Right? And that is sufficient amount. So the only thing which is left is the tuition fees, okay? So if even if you are not getting the um, the um, GA position, the student assistant position will going to cover that cost for you. Then if you are here and you talk to somebody, uh, some professor and you talk to different schools, so let's say you are very good in uh, computers, okay? Uh, you go and talk to the professor in the College of Education. They need somebody who can help them with, uh, let's say, doing some uh, basic uh, or some advanced type of analysis on data. And if you know, let's say, Excel or any other tool, in such a way that you can help the professor in those analysis, you have a very, very good chance that they will hire you. They seek for, because their students does not have that capability. So you will be there to help them out. 
you will be able to train the, the, the those students also so to summarize what i have said ga position getting a ga position at the time of your admission the possibilities are very low getting a ga position once you are here on campus in the first semester is higher than the first one and then in the second semester it is very high that you will going to get but again it depends upon your performances in the class as well as how what type of skill set you have that you are promoting to sell yourself remember it's all about skill set um getting a student assistantship job right when you enter the campus very high you you can get the job anywhere there are several jobs openings and uh, some we some, sometimes we don't have people for those jobs uh, some of the jobs are only uh, uh, are there for receptionists you can go and just sit down on a table and, and become a receptionist but you are still learning during that during the spare time you can study you are a lot of uh, restaurants over here on campus they always need people to ser for serving uh, there are uh, bookstore over here that require people to uh, their library big library which requires the, uh, uh, that uh, the student assistant can help them in putting the books in the shelves again and restocking and stuff like those so there are several types of jobs available and uh, those possibilities of getting those student assistant jobs are very high. Okay, so GA positions, if you are here, probability is very high. Again, GA position at the time of admission is very low. Did I uh, give the answer that uh, you were looking for? Yeah, thank you so much for the detailed answer. Majavin, you have a question. Hello, sir. Can you listen to me? Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. All right. First of all, thank you so much. It was really elaborative. I got most of the answers from uh, the answers you gave to Mr. Fussy. Uh, however, here I would like to uh, you to shed light on something. I have a huge gap in uh, my education. Like I completed my graduation back in 2014 uh, from NED University. And uh, now I want to start like uh, restart my studies. I got married during the time and was taking care of my family. Now I want to uh, start uh, my studies again what are the chances of me uh, you know getting to the campus and start studying again i do have a uh, you know unique skill set right now i'm working with american spaces and i'm working as the coordinator for the american spaces I started lab basically so i work in entrepreneurship and steam and uh, i'm the only one in the entire country chosen by us consulate so I have good uh, work experience uh, for one and a half year. I have good teaching experience as well. And I am also, uh, I have also been design thinking teacher and a trainer for a lot of places. Uh, can you please like uh, tell me a little about the possibility of me starting again? So here's something very good about the American education system. In American education system, we don't held anything against the fact that you have a gap in your education. We don't held that thing against you. You have the, your this is your own decision when you want to start or resume your studies. It's your own decision how you want to do that. So there is no nothing negative for you to be out for 10 years and applying for a master's degree. So just let me be, take that thing out of the equation. So it will not going to hurt. The second thing which is important is again, the two things that I talked about earlier to get in. Number one is GPA, other is English score, right? If you can do that, again, the chances are very high that you will get in. Now the concept of having a 
coming in over here and working towards your degree. So here are certain things that you need to have a clear mindset. And I will say this thing to everybody who's listening. You need to have a very clear mindset. What is your end goal? What is your end goal? And end goal not only means that you will going to obtain a degree, but also what will happen beyond a degree? What will happen beyond a degree? That's very, very important. Do you want to stay here and try to come up with a process to get a permanent residency and then later a citizenship? Or you want to get the degree and go back, All right? These, these are very, very important questions that you should have an answer because both track are totally different. Both will going to give you a total mindset and both have a very different way of you passing your life beyond 45 and 60. So you have to be very clear about it. Now, the if you are here, uh, whether you want to move, move back to your country or you want to stay, in both cases, our degree will get you a two-year time frame where you can apply and work outside or work anywhere in the United States, okay? based on our degree. So you can get a job, full-time job for two years anywhere in the USA and you are legally can stay in this country. Let's say you want to uh, continue living here. In that case, within the, these two years time frame, you have to convince with your work ethics and work skills and work that your employer is ready to sponsor you for the H-1B visa, which is the labor, labor visa. Let's say majority of time they will go, in, you can easily convince them and the, they will be ready to get you in, you know, on a H-1B visa. So your student visa will convert into a labor visa. This means that now you are legally allowed to work for six years more, beyond two years, six years more. In this six years now, you have to go to the second, to the third level. And what is the third level beyond labor is to get the permanent residency, the green card. So that's the third step. So in order for you to get, you need again a sponsor. All right, your company will sponsor you most of the time. However, there is another category in which your own personal skill set can get you the green card. All right. So my right now, one of my uh, ex student alumni or one of my ex students, as well as um, uh, one of my, uh, the, he is also coming back next year for his PhD. Uh, he's from India and uh, he is working to get, he's, he, he already have a H-1B, which is mean that he has a labor certification and he want to get a permanent residency. So what he is doing, he's applying based on his skills. And in order to do so, he has to prove to the government that his type of skill set is unique and needed for the growth of US economy. And uh, I don't know whether you guys have uh, seen our one of our posts that was done, I think two year, two days ago uh, on this gentleman whose name is Raven. And uh, if you look at it, Raven is now going not only publishing journal papers in and ensuring that people know that he has this skill set 
he has a knowledge base which is very unique so he is he's he's writing research papers with me he is writing a book chapter with me then he was invited to be a speaker in a conference not pre presenting his work no as a speaker it means that somebody that the society or the conference organizers are inviting to come and share their experience that's a very big thing so he was asked to come and do that and then i basically gave him the the opportunity to represent me in the conference as a panel speaker so there is a panel of four or five people who talks about a certain topic so i i know that this guy is very good so for my side what i did i said okay instead of me going there and be a part of the panel why don't you go and represent me over there but with your name so now what happened those are now credentials that he can use to showcase his expertise his skill set and launch his own application for the green card process so there are two ways of doing it one is that some uh, some company sponsors you another one is you you do it on your own like i did it my own on my own i didn't go with, with the university or anything so i use my credential to become a us citizen so there are ways but again this is when you are ready to 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 make the decision that you will be here so you have 2 years plus 6 years in that time frame you have to get a green card and it can be done there are thousand and thousand of people who have done it every year same amount of people gets it all right so it's not something which is which is very very unusual um, strain no it's a very common thing then uh, if you want to go back to make sure that the two years that you have given opportunity to get yourself training over here get yourself work experience try to get that thing as soon as possible get into a job get that experience learn from that experience and take that experience back to your own country all right so you need to be very very clear on these two issues then in your case let's say that there there are others also might be in a very similar case where you will going to have kids and you have a spouse so you need to start thinking about are they joining you or you will be doing it on your own and the kids and the spouse will stay in the country or all of you are you are all moving as a family because each of these st state will going to give you an opportunity to say okay now that the kids are here i have to take to make sure that they have uh, right schools all right they make sure that we they can come and go from the school so there is supriya transportation okay there should be a bigger the house or a, a apartment which can accommodate three or four of us now the, your environment and your 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 requirements are changing but you need to start planning for that uh we have majority of our um, phd students who are already uh, married uh, they usually come first and within a semester or so they will invite their spouses and the family there are people who have enough resources that they can bring in uh, their uh, 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 their their family with them um unas do you remember what is the amount that you have to pay extra to bring in one family member sir it was about 5600 dollars per 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 person for per, per, per dependent per yes. dependent per year yeah all right so that's the extra amount you have to show in order for you to bring any dependent with you uh those dependent cannot work if they are eligible if they are adults they cannot work in on that visa 
all right so that's again if you are bringing your spouse the spouse will not going to get work Under, unless spouse change the status of their uh, visa and then they will be eligible to work all right so there is a big thing that so there are several hurdles that you have to uh, think about beyond admissions Admission, as I said, will not going to care about how long you've been out of uh, studies. That doesn't matter to us. It is what you have done in the past, what skill set you have, or competency you have in your English. And the third one is, are you able to bring, have enough resources, financial resources to be here? Okay, that's the only thing. And even finances, we don't care about it. It is the uh, the uh, the... Visa officer who will be looking into that. All right. So, did I able to answer your questions? Sir, we yes, have sir, a question in chat. Very good so, answer. Chat. Ones, just a minute, Ones, please. Yeah, Majibi. Um, Yes, sir. Thank you so much. It is very well answered. I'm so sorry, you missed for cutting you off. Uh, you were the one that really introducing this uh, thing to me, and uh, you know, pro propelling me to start my studies again. Thank you so much, both of you. No problem. No problem. Yes, Unes. Sir, we have a, a question in chat that how we can apply through a normal path, like no graduate assistantship, no anything, and how will it will cost. All right, how much it will cost? Uh, what was your uh, I-20 is told you, you have, you remember that numbers? You you, you were the uh, latest one who came in. Yeah. <laughs> it was like $33,000 um, with the tuition fees and living expenses. For a year or for the whole program? For, for a year. Okay. All right. So, okay. okay. Let me explain you that. So there, uh, so one of the things that uh, we a uh, lot of people are doing, um, let's say you have your uncle or aunt or somebody in the USA or in Canada. All right. Uh, one of the things they can do is uh, they can sponsor you. Uh, we can sponsor you two ways. Either they can sponsor you by showing that uh, they can take care of your finances and giving uh, uh, and providing the finances in your bank or through your bank directly. Or what they can do, which will increase your chances of getting the visa, is to start a scholarship by their name. So let's say your uncle. Um, uh, maybe living in the in USA um, is willing to sponsor you. So uncle will going to contact us and he'll say, well, I'm not going to, I, I want to start a scholarship. And we'll help them out to start as a scholarship. And we will going to facilitate the scholarship process. And then there will be an application gathering and you can submit your application. They will select, and let's say they select you, which will be the case. And then in that way, you have the ability because the money is already there on the campus. They've already given the amount to the campus. So once you, they, we show you, uh, you uh, on your uh, letter that you already are being financed, so you don't have to show any finance when you are going for your visa interview because you are already covered through your scholarship. That will going to enhance your chances of getting the visa on the first day and the first time. But again, somebody have to sponsor you. Somebody have to provide the scholarship for you. And that scholarship have to be on campus. Uh, that is, it has to be under their under their name, but it has the money has to be in our EMU bank account. So, if somebody wants to learn more about it, they can contact me later on, and I can explain you the process. Uh, we have several people who have done that, 
um, and not only that, but they are uh, they are uh, uh, wealthy enough to sponsor more. A lot of uh, Canadians, uh, ex Canadians from Pakistan, have done that. Um, I will show you uh, that uh, uh, there is another scholarship. I can tell, show you in a minute. Let me show you another scholarship that you can apply. And this scholarship is uh, not with us, by the way. This scholarship is with the university in Texas. And uh, uh, Mr. Ashraf Habibullah, who is one of the Indians, so he has a scholarship in um, the University of Texas at Dallas, right? And uh, that is uh, a scholarship is not a big one, but it will give you $2,000 worth of scholarship. There are several scholarships like this, okay? There are several scholarships. And in, uh, in the USA, you can get as many scholarships as you want. There are a lot of scholarships which goes vacant. And again, these scholarships are not the scholarships from the university. These are people all around the world, all around the USA, who are giving these scholarships. Some of the scholarships worth $500 a year. Some of them worth $10,000 a year. Some of them worth $400 per year. Like this one is $2,000 a year. But let's say you accumulate 10 of them. You have enough money with you to support yourself. So every type of scholarship or uh, the 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 way you want to uh, finance your studies, there are various ways of doing it. What I will suggest and I will advise each one of you is to look for these scholarships in your own countries. Okay, there are in India, for example, they have. Is uh, the bank basically provide you loan for higher studies? In Bangladesh, there are small loans that are provided for higher studies. In Pakistan, there are uh, organizations who provide scholarship, but these scholarships are not huge, but these are big enough that if you accumulate four of them, that you will be financing your own studies. Uh, there used to be, and I was trying to find out, there used to be something called Pakistan Banking Council. And they used to provide uh, interest-free loans um, to for higher studies. And they can provide up to $15,000 of, uh, of loan that you have to repay uh, two years after you, you graduate, you start paying monthly a small amount. So, so there are ways of uh, of getting the the finance required. Uh, Ninety nine percent of the time, when I get emails, everybody is looking for uh, a financial assistance. Now, financial assistance are available, but again, there are not so many that we offer them to everybody, as I explained you earlier. There are so many of you, and then we have to we have only few opportunities. So it's majority of the time people will going to find ways of coming. And let me tell you, like when I came here, I I I I took loans from various people and then accumulate that loan and then put it there. There are others who did something different. From my PhD, I got a scholarship when I was coming here. For my for master's, I have to take loan. So depending upon where and how you are, you, you will be able to find something. But I will suggest investigate in your own community what type of uh, financial assistance are available. Who is providing them? There are uh, several type of clubs, gym khanas, who provide these type of scholarships. In. So you should talk to them. You should apply for them. Uh, we have a, a very uh, have have a very good LinkedIn account. Uh, try to talk to professors in other universities also. Maybe they can help you out. So again, this is a very big thing that you are coming into, and it's up to you uh, to invest your time.
you know, if you want to go out, invest your time in searching and finding out the right university for yourself and finding out right finance that can help you and support you. Any other questions? About the pre eligibility test, for what amount of time can we apply to? You can apply the pre uh, uh, the pre uh, pre eligibility test anytime. The time for the winter session, uh, if you want to apply for to start your studies over here at Eastern in uh, January first, for example, you have until the end of this month to apply officially. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, okay. Dr. Ahmed does not have a very good LinkedIn profile. Uh, I'm an old school guy, but yes, uh, Nes, can you provide him the, the my LinkedIn profile, please? Uh, you can always yes, email me. I can put down my email over here and you can always email me uh, or if you have any question or I can also put down my phone number, you can WhatsApp me. Because these are the two things which, uh, here you go, there's my uh, email and then my phone number is 33544. Here are my, my phone number, right? Any other question? All right, guys, thank you for attending. I wish you all all the best and hopefully uh, you will all be able to achieve your goals and the dreams that you have for yourself and for your family, okay? Uh, good luck to all of you.